you know. So the American people, you know, consider these two candidates the most um, most untrusted and most disliked in our history. And after the revelations of the last week, and after these last two debates, which have been pretty devoid of meaningful content, I think their assessment by the American people as not likable and not trustworthy has been absolutely vindicated. You know, this was not a good use of a viewer's time, and certainly uh, makes a mockery of what should the discussion really be and what a debate ought to look like in this election. Donald Trump said if he became president, he would put Hillary Clinton in jail, have her investigated and jail her. Your thoughts? Well, you know, I think Donald Trump, uh, he would do that, you know. He would put her in jail as his first move, you know, and then investigate her. Um, that's, that's the scary thing, you know, that that's his, uh, his respect for the democratic process. Uh, I do think that there are reasons that both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton should both be investigated. Uh, Donald Trump's business dealings, his uh, failure to pay his income taxes, um, he, uh, you know, his, uh, his record uh, with Trump University uh, abusing students and workers, he has something like, you know, I don't know, 3,000 legal cases that are still outstanding. So Donald Trump lives uh, in the court of law. He's either suing people or being sued most of the time. That seems to be his uh, mode of operating. Um, I think there are, you know, Hillary, uh, Hillary's uh, emails, her distribution of favors to big donors uh, on the company watch while serving as Secretary of State and then disappearing those emails uh, under which she was conducting her own private business and uh, on the email server, where she also made public uh, highly confidential, top-secret information. You know, the FBI said that she was too big to jail. Uh, that's why they said that she wouldn't be investigated, because no district attorney would uh, dare to take her on. You know, that's not really uh, a great reason. I, I think I agree with Donald Trump in principle, but she ought to be investigated, uh, not just thrown into jail. And Jill Stein, what about you mentioned uh, one of the things that the WikiLeaks uh, release uh, uh, revealed about uh, Clinton's uh, speeches, namely this public private uh, position that she uh, articulated. But what else did we learn from those revelations, uh, the speeches that she gave, excerpts of the speeches she gave uh, to Wall Street? You know, I haven't seen the whole um, the whole release, but another comment of great interest was what she said a couple of years back to a housing industry uh, trade group, uh, where she said that—oh, actually, no, I think this was for Goldman Sachs. I take it back. I think she said this to Goldman Sachs, that she didn't have a lot of contact with everyday people because of the extraordinary fortunes—and I paraphrase her there, but to that effect, because of the incredible economic fortunes that she and Bill uh, have experienced, you know, due to their connections uh, in the world of the economic elite serving them as the political elite. And indeed, Hillary Clinton really represents that merger of economic and political elite that I think people find so um, painful and objectionable about where our political system has gone in this economy that uh, is throwing people under the bus. Yeah, just to quote exactly what uh, uh, the WikiLeaks revealed about that, the speech that you mentioned, she was saying, talking about uh, middle-class concerns about money. Uh, Clinton said, quote, they're kind of far removed because the life I've lived and the economic, you know, fortunes that my husband and I, and I now enjoy, but I haven't forgotten that. Uh, so those were uh, Clinton's remarks, as revealed by WikiLeaks uh, last week, her speeches to Goldman Sachs. Uh, and what about, uh, Dr. Stein, the exchange between Clinton and Trump uh, this evening on the question of Syrian refugees? Yes. So, again, I was um, 
I was intermittently broadcasting, so I may not have caught all of that. But, you know, what we heard was more of what we've heard from them before, where, you know, Donald uh, basically fearmongers Syrian refugees, and Hillary rightly called for increasing uh, the uh, the uh, number of refugees allowed to come to our country. And, you know, I just want to make the point that, yes, indeed, uh, we've had such a hand in generating this crisis, not only through our intervention, our bombing, our support for um, uh, re rebels that are part of the uh, terrorist network, although we call them good terrorists, you know, we've had a hand in the chaos in Syria, for, you know, in a big way. Uh, but not only there, we also fed that fire through the catastrophe of Libya, which was Hillary Clinton's, you know, pride and joy. That was her undertaking. She led the charge for that morass that developed in Syria. She also supported Iraq, you know. So these are part of the ongoing catastrophe that both she and Donald would like to have more of. We don't know exactly what Donald wants to do, but he's certainly beating the military drum. Hillary, you know, is calling for a no-fly zone, which is absolutely terrifying. And Mikhail Gorbachev, the former uh, premier of the Soviet Union, uh, who, you know, who was very instrumental in ending the Cold War, he made a statement this week that he has never seen us so close to the verge of nuclear war, and Hillary wants to start an air war with Russia when, between the two of us, we've got 2,000 nuclear uh, warheads on hair trigger alert. This is absolutely uh, terrifying, and neither Hillary nor Donald are reality checking at all about what this means, what an incredibly dangerous moment this is. This is not a time to be plunging headlong uh, into war. Yes, we need to do our part on the Syrian refugees, uh, but let's stop creating those refugees in the first place, and let's stop this catastrophic policy on war. We heard no discussion in this debate about where we've gotten with these uh, wars on terror, so-called, which have only created more terror failed states and mass refugee migrations. We need to get down to the bottom of this. Let me ask you uh, about the issue of climate change, which was not directly asked, though uh, this was a, a town hall where members of the audience could ask questions. They were vetted and chosen by Anderson Cooper and Martha Raddatz of ABC and CNN. Um, after this debate, 350 Action Executive Director May Bouvi issued the following statement. She said, We finally got a question about energy policy in the 89th minute of the debate, although it left out any mention of climate change. The answers we got revealed the fault lines in this election. Trump doubled down on fossil fuels, while Hillary talked about a clean energy future that doesn't leave anyone behind. Her one big mistake was naming natural gas as a bridge fuel. In reality, it's just a fast lane to more climate destruction. Jill Stein, you were arrested out in North Dakota with your vice presidential running mate, Ajamu Baraka, uh, protesting the, th the $3.8 billion um, a Dakota Access Pipeline. I don't know if you heard, but right before we went to air with the debate, um, a federal court uh, issued its decision, a surprise even to the tribe that it came out today on this eve of Indigenous Peoples Day, Columbus Day, um, ruling against their request for an injunction for the pipeline company to keep uh, uh, building. Uh, so that is the trigger for allowing it to continue. So your thoughts on what the candidate said and what you feel is the answer? Well, the candidates continue this very destructive and dangerous mythology that there is an energy future other than 100 percent clean renewable energy. There is no other energy future, and there is no other future. Uh, that is the way forward. And having been uh, at the Standing Rock Sioux uh, encampment, it was a real inspiration to see the courage of indigenous leaders who are standing up uh, to defend not only their human rights and all of our human rights, their water supply and all of our water supply, uh, their climate and our climate. And the arrest warrants that were uh, put out for yourself, for myself, for the indigenous leaders above all, you know, those were the wrong arrest warrants. 
those arrest warrants should have been issued for the Dakota Access Pipeline. Those are the real vandals who are vandalizing our human rights, our water, our climate, and Mother Earth. And I think we just have to be very clear about setting the record straight. This is why we need to have a real debate. This is why a debate between Donald and Hillary uh, is a scam. Uh, it is a uh, phony, sham debate uh, being used to keep the American people in the dark. We are facing an all-out crisis here on the climate. And we don't have another four years to sit around and wait on this. And I really encourage people to stand up like our indigenous uh, leaders in Standing Rock and not allow ourselves to be hoodwinked into uh, a lesser evil campaign that thinks that fracking is the answer to our energy future. The Democrats would not even adopt it as a voluntary plank in their platform to oppose fracking. Hillary's transition director, Ken Salazar, is a big booster of fracking and of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So yeah, there may be differences between these two candidates, but the differences, unfortunately, are not enough to save your life to save your job or to save the planet. We are the ones we've been waiting for, and it's important for us not to be talked into powerlessness that they would like us to believe that we are. In fact, 43 million young people in debt uh, alone is enough that could win this election if they were actually able to just get word that there is a candidate that they can come out and vote for. That's a winning plurality of the vote. We could take over this election in the remaining time as Donald Trump continues to uh, unravel and uh, serious questions continue to be raised uh, about Hillary Clinton. It's really important for us, we the people, to be the ones that are informed and empowered to choose a future that we want, not just to decide who's the scariest candidate out there and vote against them. That politics of fear has delivered everything we were afraid of. It's time to stand up with politics of courage, like uh, the courageous leaders at Standing Rock Sioux Nation. We need to stand up, reject the lesser evil, and fight for the greater good, like our lives depend on it, because they do. But Dr.